much and uh, g'day, welcome to Australia. And uh, we do actually say g'day in Australia. It's not an affectation. Um, a little bit about uh, myself first. Um, I'm a herpetologist uh, based in Queensland. Um, I've worked at the Queensland Museum since the 1980s. And I've been very fortunate to live in a continent with a ridiculously high biodiversity um, in terms of, uh, well, we've got over a thousand species of reptiles in Australia. Um, can we hear me okay here? I'm just trying Yeah, to, we can hear you fine. We haven't got your video, but we have got your screen. Trying to proceed with my, uh, here we are, yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, we've got uh, at last count 1,137 described species of Australian reptiles. Um, I've made it my uh, life's passion to see as many of them as I can. And I'm very fortunate to have been able to um, author and co-author quite a few books on Australian herpetology. This is a few of them here. Uh, included is the Complete Guide to Australia, which is in its sixth edition. I'm working on edition seven now. Um, what I'm proposing is a tour to three biodiverse hotspots in Australia. Now, Australia is huge. To fly from here to here is about a five or six hour flight between, say, Brisbane and Perth. Um, so we won't be doing that. Um, this area here is called the Wet Tropics, and uh, that's where I'll be starting. I'll be then proceeding through to what we call the top end of the Northern Territory and then down into Central Australia. So the Wet Tropics, these dark green areas are essentially World Heritage Tropical Rainforest. Uh, going from sea level through to Montane Heath. Um, it includes a number of regional towns and, and um, developed areas and pristine, fabulous um, areas for herpetology. This is a very typical view of, uh, of the wet tropics. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to some of the things that we'll be hoping to find there. Um, starting with this iconic chameleon gecko. Now, a feature of the wet tropics is the high level of endemism. Uh, huge numbers of uh, plant, animal species are found nowhere but the wet tropics. That includes this chameleon gecko. Um, it's fairly easy to find with a head torch. The technique for finding nocturnal geckos is to locate them by their eye shine. These are often sitting head downwards on saplings. This one has a regenerated tail. The original tail has got white rings on it. Um, an interesting thing about this gecko, it's the only one I know of in the world that when the tail is broken, the actual tail makes a noise. It stridulates <laughs> as it wriggles around. I've never seen it on any other reptile. Another very common uh, reptile in the wet tropics, very easy to see as the, uh, the the northern leaf tail gecko. Um, by day, they're in the uh, the buttress trunks of the giant figs and sometimes sitting exposed and camouflaged on the outer surfaces of trunks. And uh, at night, they've got that really nice bright eye shine. You can pick them up by torchlight. Uh, a feature of Australian... Um, habitats right across the whole continent is a very high number of skinks. Uh, Tyrone mentioned some of the burrowing skinks in southern Africa. We have a whole range of skinks here, more than 400 species. So uh, anytime you're, mo you're moving through any Australian habitat, the most likely things you'll be seeing is skinks. This is another wet tropic endemic, a tiny little moisture-loving, leaf litter-inhabiting four-fingered skink. Underneath the logs, these very abundant prickly forest skinks, um, another wet tropics endemic. They believe that the um, rough scales are to disperse moisture across the surface. In some areas, virtually every single log has a, a prickly forest skink living under it. If you're fortunate, you'll see the Boyd's forest dragons. There are some areas where they're reasonably easy to see. 
uh, including at Lake Boreen, where these two were both photographed, and the the benefits of Lake Boreen. It's a perched volcanic lake surrounded by rainforest, and it also hosts an excellent um, little tea house. So you can have your have your Devonshire teas, look out over the lake at the turtles swimming around, and then take a walk through the tropical rainforest and see these Boyd's forest dragons. They're not a swift animal. They just sit quietly on the tree trunks. They'll slide around the other side out of view. But usually when you see a Boyd's forest dragon, you're able to get your cameras out and get nice, decent photographs like this. Australia's largest python, Australia's largest snake, is uh, right through the wet tropics and then on up into Cape York. The amethyst python, um, around about five metres, is a, is a moderately large individual. Uh, they've evolved to prey on things like large wallabies. Uh, we have a, a number of uh, what we call the colubrid snakes, the um, harmless, non-venomous uh, tree snakes, and the freshwater snake. This is one of the few Australian snakes that's able to prey on introduced and highly toxic uh, cane toads or marine toads and usually survive. It's a bit of Russian roulette as far as the snake goes, though they do sometimes succumb. Australia has um, a level of infamy, I suppose, by the, the number of um, highly venomous elapid snakes that we have, including the taipan. Um, they're not easy to see, but along the edges of the cane fields, the sugar cane fields throughout the wet tropics, on a nice warm morning, there's a reasonable chance of seeing one um, lying out on the edge of the cane. And uh, we don't have any vipers in Australia, but we do have viper analogues, which are the death adders. There are lapids, um, front fang venomous land snakes with, uh, with uh, fixed fangs, unlike the hinged fangs of vipers. Um, but they have the same life strategy of being a, uh, a sedentary, sit and wait, concealed, fast striking snake with a little segmented tail tip that it can lure its prey. There's a couple of areas in the wet tropics. Uh, there's a couple of roads that are very good to drive along um, where there's a good chance of seeing these death adders. And bandy bandies are right through eastern Australia. Um, so in rainforest, the eucalypt forest, they've got this weird habit of throwing the body up into contorted hoops as a, as a distraction from predators. This is an exclusive snake eater. It feeds almost entirely on uh, little harmless burrowing snakes called blind snakes. And then, of course, at Lake Boreen, you've got all of these turtles. Very easy to see. Great photographic subjects. And, of course, the frogs. There's a ridiculously high number of uh, frog species throughout the wet tropics, including the green-eyed frog. The orange thighed frogs. These are the sorts of things that form these enormous choruses uh, after rain with huge numbers or aggregate together near a, near a pond and just form these deafening choruses, thousands of individuals. Of course, not everything is reptiles. Uh, as you're moving through the wet tropics, there's the chance of seeing the uh, southern cassowaries, one of our giant flightless birds, and also quite... Uh, quite dangerous if you interfere with them that uh, that bony cask is quite quite a weapon as are the claws so they're very easy to uh, to um to see if you're in the right places and then there's tree kangaroos yes in australia some of our kangaroos have actually climbed up trees we have two species in australia one in the wet tropics one in cape york and then several others in new guinea uh, there's some excellent viewing areas for platypus, one of our egg-laying mammals. And, of course, we've got these beautiful butterflies that are flying around or any of the, any of the sunny gardens and forest glades and so forth. And one of the, the signature species for the Cairns wet tropics area is the Cairns birdwing. 
and some pretty nice, comfortable places to stay. Now, moving to the top end of the Northern Territory, it's mostly, there's some massive rock outcrops, um, savannah woodlands, mangrove areas. This is in Kakadu National Park, which is a vast uh, wilderness. Temperatures are generally very high here, so you've always got to make sure you've got plenty of water and pace yourself. Fantastic areas for herpetology, both spotlighting at night and also uh, morning and late afternoon walking. And uh, if you are tempted to jump into a lovely cool water hole like this while you're in the in the in the top end, well, don't. The uh, saltwater crocodiles or salties as we call them uh, are right through the area. There are some safe areas to swim. And there's a lot of areas where you'll see signs saying, you know, do not swim. And if there are no signs at all, assume you can't swim there. Um, we've got the two species up there. This is the the the, the big one, the one that uh, has been responsible for fatalities. And then there's the much more slender fish-eating uh, freshwater crocodile. Some fabulous geckos right through the wet uh, through the uh, the top end. Um, this velvet gecko occurs on various outcrops across the region with different um, uh, brightly coloured uh, colour variants on different outcrops. Another uh, of our more famous reptiles, the frill neck lizard, uh, typically seen sitting upright on slender uh, trunks like this. Most people photograph them with the frills up. Um, I prefer to just stalk one with a telephoto lens and get these sorts of in situ photos of a nice calm individual. The Merton's water monitor is right through the region. It used to be abundant, but with the introduction of this uh, cane toad I mentioned earlier, numbers have crashed and it's now listed as an endangered species. But there are several areas where they still remain very, very common. Uh, I used to visit the area many, many years ago before the toads were there and you'd walk along the river banks and you'd hear the, the crash and the plop as it dashes up a trunk and plops into the water. There are still some areas quite close to Darwin where you can still see them fairly easily. Another of the very common monitor lizards in the, uh, the top end is the spotted tree goanna. It's quite an urban species throughout the city of Darwin in parks and gardens. And much more secretive, this tiny little northern uh, ridgetail monitor. One of the things that monitor lizards have done in Australia, which they haven't done elsewhere, is evolved dwarfism. This tiny little species is only 20 centimetres long maximum. Uh, one of the largest skinks in the world, the northern blue tongue. And there's a very diverse python fauna in the in the wet tropics. There's an area called Fog Dam, which I'd like to take people to, which has a, a very, very high um, biomass of water pythons. And there's a, um, a little road that you can drive along that goes right across the dam wall and uh, pythons just crossing backwards and forwards all night. Another of the large top end pythons is the olive python, very common around the uh, rock outcrops and caves and across the open savanna. And the mangroves, you've got to be careful working anywhere near mangroves because there are crocodiles, but there are some areas with a boardwalk where you can see these rear fanged mangrove snakes cruising around on the mud at night. And in the rock outcrops, you get these what we call night tigers or brown tree snakes. Many of the Australian snakes are venomous, but a lot of them have quite weak venom just designed to prey prim uh, primarily on little, little lizards like skinks. And that's the case with this moon snake. Now we're moving into the central Australian desert, and this plant here is called spinifex, and it's one of the triggers for the, the extreme biodiversity in the Australian deserts. Everywhere this tussock of spinifex grows with its interlocking needles of sharp spines, the biodiversity, especially of lizards, 
goes through the roof. There are species that use it as cover to dash between while they're running around in the daytime. There are species that dig their burrows underneath it. And there are species that live exclusively within it. That includes the jewel gecko, which is only found inside spinifex clumps. You'll never find one under a stone or up a tree. They're only in those clumps of spinifex. Also living in those clumps is this Burton snake lizard. Very snake-like. It's actually very closely related to geckos. And it's an exclusive lizard eater. So it would be moving in those clumps and between them, uh, hunting any of the lizards that, uh, that it encounters. And this is the one that everybody wants to see when they come to Central Australia, the, uh, the thorny devil, Moloch horridus. It uh, walks like a clockwork, clockwork toy with, uh, with jerky little steps as it walks across the roads with its tail curved up across it over its back. It's unmistakable. It's an exclusive anteater. Um, sits beside an ant trail and picks up every ant that runs under its nose. Uh, it has a, 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 each individual has its own latrine site where you can see all the droppings. And I've put some of those droppings under the microscope. Obviously, they're full of ant remains, but the interesting thing is that there's almost no grains of sand. So every dab of that tongue on an ant is a direct hit. They're extraordinary creatures with that false head positioned on the neck. So if it's harassed, it'll tuck its head down and produce that and present that false head. Another one of our pygmy monitors, one of the um, dwarf species, extremely elusive. Um, lucky to see one, but very common to see their tracks uh, moving uh, through the spin effects on the red sand. The first experience I had with these was uh, on a desert sand hill in Central Australia. And I saw the tracks of one, and those tracks, when I followed them, moved across and crossed one of my own footprints. And I'd only been there for five minutes. So they knew I was there, but I hadn't seen them. The bearded dragon, um, another famous Australian species, very, very common right across central Australia. You see them sitting on fence posts and stumps and so forth. This is the common one that you will see dashing around between those spinifex clumps, these hyper-fast central military dragons. They're great fun to stalk with a telephoto lens. They're an annual, so the, there's a whole population die-off each year, and then you get a new generation come through the following year. At night on the desert sand dunes, You'll see these gorgeous knob-tailed geckos. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me how something that appears so translucent and fragile exists in an area with such a, a, a baking sun, high temperature, high daytime temperatures. But it's all about avoiding those extremes, not tolerating them. So by day, it's tucked away in its little burrow down in the in the moist sand. And then at night, they come out and patrol the open sandy areas. Central Australian region is also bisected by uh, some ancient uh, river systems. And when you get into these uh, rocky gorges with the big uh, uh, ghost gums, the, the white trunk eucalypts along the edges, you get into a, a different fauna, which includes Australia's biggest lizard, the parenti. A uh, very common sight all through those central gorges are the long-nosed dragons. Very fast, great things to watch as they do their head bobs and wave their arms and chase each other, display to each other. And this is Australia's heaviest bodied gecko. It's about the size of a sort of a half-grown rat, I suppose, in its body mass the Centralian knob-tailed gecko. And that ridiculous little tail that you can see there is not a regenerated tail. That's it. That's all it gets. That's the only tail it ever has. Uh, it's one of the few species in the world which can't drop that tail and grow a new one. 
What's the point? There's nothing to lose. These are fairly easy to find in those rocky areas at night with a headlamp. And then in the open areas, you get the Centralian blue tongue lizard. As far as the snakes go, um, one of the things that everybody likes to see in Central Australia is the Woma python. This is a reptile specialist. Uh, and because it is hunting reptile uh, prey that doesn't give off a body heat, it's one of the one of only two pythons in the world that no longer has those heat sensitive pits that pythons have to locate warm blooded prey. It feeds on things like bearded dragons, goannas, snakes. And then we, if the rain comes while you're in Central Australia, then up out of nowhere comes uh, comes frogs in places you could never believe they could possibly exist. And then there's our tiny little marsupials. When you think of Australian marsupials, you think of things like kangaroos, koalas, wombats. But the the bulk of our small of our marsupials are small insectivores like this little done art mouse sized so that's a summary of the fauna that i would be hoping to show you uh, there is never a guarantee of seeing anything it's all in the lap of the gods the weather uh, but there is always the chance that um that uh fate will shine on you and it's very likely that we would see most of the species that I've been able to show you tonight. So thank you very much.